KC family and visiting friends, we would like to welcome you to our virtual worship worship service. <laughs> I'm your girl, Jada Woods. And, and I'm your boy, Jonathan Woods. And we're so glad that you guys are tuned in with us on our virtual live experience. If you have any family or friends, comment down below, tag their name, let them know that ANC is live, and let them know that ANC is ready to worship. We are hoping that you get something great out of this experience. And don't forget our social media platforms. We are also on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And don't forget that we are the church that lifts people by lifting Jesus. Let's, Let's get, get into, into it. it. Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, all nations and our streaming friends and family. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all in on our Wednesday night service. I'm telling you, God has something magnificent with you in mind, and I'm just so happy and excited and elated to share the word of God with you on tonight. I do like to honor our pastor, Bishop Designate Woods, in his absence, um, and we honor him and we cover him in prayer. And we know that as he's seeking the Lord, God has put us in a place to see him for ourselves and where we go from here as well so join me as we prepare to go into the Word of God um, on tonight uh, I had something special in mind but God kind of rerouted me and I know when he does those kind of things he's very intentional everything that God does is intentional so tonight we're going to talk about back to the basics back to the basics and our scripture reference on tonight is going to be second chronicles 7 13 through 14 and it goes like this if i shut up heaven and there be no rain or if i command the locusts to devour the land or if i send pestilence among my people if my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land and I want to talk about tonight back to the basics back to the basics so when I was uh, praying and seeking the Lord uh, I was reminded of my home church where I grew up in and some of the basic things were they had prayer night where you may have been a Monday night I know Sunday you just had a Sunday service Sunday afternoon service but on Monday nights we would have prayer meeting and that's where all the saints would come together and they would kneel down it didn't matter if you were sitting in the front in the middle or in the back but you would come into the service and you would begin to kneel down and just call upon the name of the Lord it didn't mean anything was going on it didn't say something was wrong or we had a great demand from the Lord but it was prayer service where we all gathered together and prayed and seek the face of the Lord and it didn't matter what the sister beside you or the brother that beside you was praying for it that was the time and the space and the opportunity where we all begin to seek the Lord for ourselves and I want to say this as we start our lesson on tonight that since the start of the pandemic we've all quoted 2nd Chronicles 7 and 14 um, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways we've all quoted it we've all stood on it and we've prayed it beckoning and we repeated it beckoning the people to come together repent and let's pray together and it seems like the more and the more we quoted this scripture the less unified we are now the less unified things are I mean we went from the pandemic to all of the racism and the uproar in the country and it seems like the more we quoted it the less uh, we came together we can see our differences clearly this is a place where the enemy wants us to be in he wants us to be divided he wants us to see the differences in one another if it's the differences by the race or if it's differences um, in what community or your uh, financial backing whatever it may be the enemy wants us to acknowledge our differences and the sad part is he wants us to acknowledge it but he wants us to harbor in on it and stay there in that place because as long as there is no unity there's always going to be dysfunction there's always going to be confusion and we know that the devil is the author of confusion this enemy wants us to be in the place where we begin to label one another as enemies 
We begin and we, we remain divided no matter what the reason is at all. And the truth of the matter is we only have one enemy. My, my Caucasian sisters and brothers, they're not my enemies. My Hispanic sisters and brothers, they're not my enemies. The Asians are not my enemies. We have one common enemy and that is the devil. It is not enough for us to come together and agree in one area, but disagree in a thousand different areas. Because in the things that we agree in will become so small and so minute uh, in comparison to the things that we disagree on. So we must align ourselves to be in focus with one another, to come together for the greater cause. I don't care what color your hair is, I don't care what neighborhood you come from, but the Bible declares that we are many members but one body. As a church, we have to engage what I like to call uh, the tug of war. And many of you remember what tug of war was as children. It was a game that was played you had uh, your your team and an opposing team and you would grab a hold to a rope and one team you you may have a puddle of mud or a line that you had to pull the opposite team across that line and that would define who wins the game we have spent as the body of Christ spending time trying to defend our doctrines and less time trying to be defenders of God's word we have stopped fighting the enemy and standing against the enemy and stopped standing against sin and we we only begin to defend our own personal beliefs. Uh, I don't care if it's pants or makeup. Whatever it is, we have begun to defend our own personal beliefs and a lot of those beliefs cannot be supported by God's word. In a world where so many have turned their back on God because of poor examples of what the body of Christ really is, we still have invested time and more time in, in going on about menial things, majoring in minor things. Matthew 24 and 12 says this and because of iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold so the issues that we are seeing is not a people problem at all it is a sin problem pointing fingers and shifting the blame is not going to fix anything but the church I grew up in used to sing a song that said this victory victory shall be mine if I hold my peace let the Lord fight my battle victory victory shall be mine that that didn't mean that we were going to tuck our tails and go stand in a corner and be quiet and do nothing. But that meant that we were going to engage in prayer. It meant we were going to engage in fasting, pushing our plates back that we may be able to seek the face of the Lord clearly. We would engage in spiritual warfare. It's important that we don't be become so vocal that we give away our battle strategy. We go about fighting like the world, acting like the world, but now it's time to reel it back in. Sometimes your battle strategy it needs to be just amongst you and those who are amongst your army it does not be it does not need to be displayed for everybody to see second corinthians 10 4 through 5 says this for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through god to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of god and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of christ it is time now that we understand that we are not fighting a tangible or a physical or a visible enemy. But the enemy, the Satan and his army, they are um, organized. Hallelujah. They're organized and they have set up systems to destroy the people of God. But this is the time where we galvanize together as believers and say, yeah, we, our church name may be different. Yeah, we may worship under a different denomination, but we are many members, but one body. We must come together in spiritual warfare and realize that the enemy is trying to take us out. It doesn't take much. Hallelujah. It wouldn't take much for the saints to gather together and call upon the name of the Lord in the old church. They would come together and begin to seek the Lord. They would come together to seek his counsel, to seek his defense, and to get the strategy on how do we move forward. When we look at 2 Chronicles 6, we find the buildup to the Lord's response in 2 Chronicles in 7. 2 Chronicles 7. It is Solomon, the son of King David, 
who goes before the Lord after the house of God is built in Jerusalem. Solomon blesses the people of God, uh, the people of Israel, and then he kneels down before the people and lifts his hand towards heaven and cries out to God. Solomon cries out because he knows that the children of Israel has a history of failing God. They have a history of failing God so much to where God would cause their enemies to have them in captivity and they would be slaves to their enemies. Hallelujah. So Solomon prayer, prayers were much like, God, I'm acknowledging that I'm leading a people who have some frailties, that have some issues, that have a tendency of turning their back. But I need to get in a posture with you so to where when they fall, when they mess up, they have a way of getting back to God. So he comes and he goes before God and says, hey, this is what we're going to do. If they fail, if they can come into the house of the Lord and lift up their hands and repent of the sin that they have done, he says, then I want you to forgive their sins. I want you to heal them. I want you to restore them. And so that is what chapter seven is going into God's response to Solomon after he goes to him, after they erect the temple, after the people come together, after they gather the sacrifices and the burnt offerings before the Lord, and after they yield those sacrifices and God receives the Savior, this essence of the burnt offerings up into heaven, he responds to, to Solomon. And it says, 2 Chronicles 6, 30, 6, 30 through 31, it says, render unto every man according unto all his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou only knowest the heart of the children of men, that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways so long as they live in the land which thou gave to our fathers. It is Solomon who goes before God and says, hey, you, I, I'm, I'm merely a man. I'm king, but I'm merely a man. So God, you know the hearts of men. So I'm, I'm putting a place between you and man to say, hey, judge the hearts of men. And God is going to do that anyways, but it is an honorable thing to come back before, come before God and render unto him voluntarily because God can get it involuntarily. But it's nice when we can come to God and render ourselves involuntarily to him wholeheartedly. Solomon was well aware that the people of God would fail God, but he went before God on the behalf of the people. God's response, response to the prayer of Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7. And fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Verse 12 reads this, and it says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. The Lord acknowledges three things that he would do, hallelujah, if we did not obey him. He says, if I would shut up heaven and there would be no rain. We all know that rain is a form of precipitation and precipitation is, is needed to maintain the atmosphere balance. Without precipitation, all of the land on the planet would be a great big desert. Precipitation also helps the farmers grow crops and provide fresh water for us to drink and for the livestock on the earth. He said, secondly, I will command the locusts to devour the land. And now locust is a, a form of a grasshopper. And when grasshoppers are usually solitary um, 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 insects, however, when they're considered to be locusts, they have overproduced because of the abundance of a harvest. And when that is done, is that means that there is something in them that acknowledges the fact that there is an abundance of harvest. Isn't it amazing how many times we get in trouble with God when there is an abundance of a harvest. That when God has blessed us, when he has opened up the windows of heaven and poured us out blessings that we don't have room enough to receive, then those are the moments that we slow down on acknowledging God. When we don't put him first, when we take him out of being the center of our world, when there is an abundance, God has a tendency of sending in the locust to devour the harvest up. And then he said, thirdly, he says, I, I can send and pestilence and and it seems like pestilence most people would define it as something pest uh, a pest or a rodent or whatnot but it is actually an infectious disease doesn't that sound familiar 
he said he would send pestilence and pestilence is even listed in revelation as one of the the reflections of the end times god says that if he does these things then we should and we as his people have a responsibility to respond a certain way he says if my people who are called by my name as people of god we must be first be willing to be called by his name as christians the name christian is a pointer to our salvation that we are called to be christians that we are christ-like he says that old things are passed away and behold all things are made new that we are new in jesus christ that we are baptized with him that when we go down it is the burial the death burial and the resurrection it is the the acknowledging of the old man burying the old man and, and acknowledging and walking in the new man he says that if we are his people and we are called by his name then we should by matthew 13 and 14 be the salt of the earth we should be a city that is set upon a hill the light of the world we are in the world but not of the world we must acknowledge these things that we are in the world but not of the world so there are some things that the world does that it should not even be named amongst the saints there are some behaviors that um, the world displays that as believers we should not display those things it doesn't matter if it's in the marketplace if it's in the workplace wherever it may be we are to name the name of Christ at all times secondly he says humble ourselves now that seems like a hard thing to do but I understand one thing James 4 and 6 says but he giveth more grace to the humble wherefore he said God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble I want you to know my dear sisters and brothers that when we resist uh, when God when we become prideful God resists us he turns us away he pushes us away but he gives grace unto the humble to be humble is one to possess or display humility humility is defined as a low self-regard and sense of unworthiness when you say that you're unworthy it does not mean that you're worthless it means that you understand that you are unworthy of the blessings of the Lord that God has blessed you because his mercy endures forever God has blessed you because the, all the earth is his the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein when we acknowledge the fact that God is good in spite of that God is right no matter what I'm doing that God is a great God that he is omnipotent he's almighty there is none that can compare to him even God himself said when I saw nobody I could swear by I swore by myself hallelujah we have to understand that God is that kind of God and he sets he sits on high and he looks down low and he he sees the actions and the behaviors of men and it is important for us to acknowledge as his people I don't care what your title is I don't care what your job function is I don't care how much money you have in the bank at the end of the day we are unworthy of the mercy and the grace of God it is God hallelujah that looks down upon us and has mercy on us it is God that looks past all of our faults and he sees our need we have to acknowledge hallelujah glory to God that God is great and he's mighty he has mercy on whom he will and it is us his people that we need him he doesn't need us that before we were he is and after we will be gone he will be God will be ever from everlasting to everlasting so we must acknowledge that we are nothing without him when we humble ourselves we put God in his proper place we understand that we are his people and that he has made us and he has created us in his image and in his likeness he says then that we should pray to pray is to invoke or to act or seek or activate a report with God by worship through deliberate communication in the narrow sense the term refers to the act of supplication or intercession directed to God hallelujah isn't it amazing how God all he wants is for us to acknowledge him all he wants for us is to come to him as children before their father isn't it amazing how God he's such an amazing such an incredible so powerful 
powerful that all he's saying is he says I know all the things that you're going through I know all the things that you're facing but all I'm asking for you to do is to acknowledge me it's to come before me and my husband always says it so nice he says God does not get engaged with something that we don't invite him in many times as believers we have meltdowns about things that we have not invited God into we have meltdowns God everything is going wrong God they won't give me that raise on my job God I'm having this problem and that problem my kids are acting crazy money's tight so many things going on in my family and we we whine and we complain but very few times do we stop and we put it before God I admit that that's sometimes as uh, as a child of God we feel like we can do it all by ourselves but I want to tell you you can't do that I want to tell you that if you acknowledge God if you go before him if you seek him then he will step into your situation God is such a gentleman he's not a rapist he's a gentleman that he waits on us to invite him in he sees it but he wants you to acknowledge the fact that you need him not just that you need him but also that you want him to be engaged in your life it means that we acknowledge God hallelujah not just when things are bad but when also when things are going good I do not treat God like he's a magic genie and I only talk to him when I want something I I can admit that there was a time in my Christian walk with Christ where when things were good everything was just wonderful it was very few times that I kneeled down and sat cloth and ashes as old school would say and begin to seek the Lord but I, when things went bad when money got a little tight when the kids were sick or something going on in my family I began to seek and call on the name of the Lord and I learned something from my husband he says that if you want God involved in your life you got to make God involved in your everyday life not just when something is going on not just when there's a milestone but you've got to put him in everything proverbs 3 and 6 says is in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path he says then that we should seek his face we acknowledge that everything that is belongs to God and he has full control over it no one wants and not even I not I'm sure none of you that are listening to the sound of my voice none of us wants a part-time lover only someone who calls when the power bill is due but we all want someone who wants to be in our presence who loves us who's concerned about us who cannot stand to be away from us God is the same way and much more because everything that we are is because of who he is it is important that when we seek God that we're not seeking him for his hand when we have quoted 2nd Chronicles 7 we have quoted it asking God to heal our land but there are sometimes there are things that we must do he says if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways there are steps to getting God to heal our land quoting it is not good enough saying it over and over is not good enough running around your parking lot or running around your home because we can't run around the sanctuary right now wherever you choose to run wherever you choose, you choose to clap your hands and lift your hands that's not going to be good enough if you don't do the first steps he says if my people who are called by my name hallelujah would humble themselves and pray and seek my face there is a process there is a there are steps to get God's attention to get God to move on our behalf and it's not just something we say verbally it's not just something we do temporary because God is a discerner of the hearts of men this is a, a repenting this is a turning away from hallelujah God wants us to come to him for more than just his stuff then lastly he says turn from their wicked ways first John 2 15 through 16 says love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but of the world that means that everything that we desire that pulls us away from God everything that we seek that pulls 
pulls our attention and our focus away from God. Those things are not of God. Those things are of the world. Hallelujah. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Those were the things that we talked about last week that got uh, Adam and Eve in trouble in the garden. She looked at the tree and she saw those wonderful things and she listened to the words of the serpent and those things drew her in and she took and she ate of the fruit and she gave to her husband who was with her per the scripture. It is important that we realize that those things are not of the father. Those things are of the world. Uh, in this world, everybody wants to prosper. In this world, everyone wants to live in a nice house. In this world, everybody wants to drive nice. And I'm not saying those things are going to take you to hell. But when those things are your main focus, when those things are your main goal in earth, your main reason for living, it takes our focus away from God. So we must realign ourselves to say, God, you are the center of my world. God, you are the head. God, you, I put you first in everything because I know if I do that, anything else will be added. And not because I need those things, but because I know how to put you in your proper place. First Corinthians three and three says, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife, divisions, are, are ye not carnal and walk as men. This is a time where we have to realign ourselves because the scripture declares that the carnal mind is enmity against um, God, that the flesh is not subject to the law of God and neither indeed can be. We must realign ourselves and say, are those things in me? Envying, strife, divisions. If you, if you turn on the news, you can turn on CNN, you can turn on your local news, all the things that have gone on. So many children were killed over the holiday weekend. So many shootings and we have to ask ourselves, in the end, strife, um, divisions. Uh, he says, are ye not carnal and walk as men? And then we cannot, even as parents, I'm a, a mother of two teenagers. We have to teach our children what's right and what's wrong. We have to pour into them the things of God. And, it, and we can't look to our churches and we can't. Now you see for sure you can't look to the church and you cannot look to the school to do certain things. It is our job. We are, they are our first ministry. It lines up to us first to handle the things. Most of us, we ask for children. We ask for the responsibility. Now it is our time to put in the work, to hand sculpt and to mold the individuals that God has created, not just for us to be, but for our children to be. It is time now that we rise up and we acknowledge that we need God. When we do all of these things, then God says, I will hear from heaven. We want God to hear from heaven. It seems as if God has turned a deaf ear on us. We want hear him to hear from heaven. That means God, he extends his ear to the earth and he begins to hear our cries. He begins to hear our prayers. He says, I will forgive sin. Isn't it amazing when he says that even coming up to those stages, he says, I will hear from heaven. Forgive sin. Isn't that amazing that he requires those steps first before the forgiving of sin? Because just repenting is not just a verbal thing, but it is a conditioning of the heart to says, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to hurt Christ. I don't want to crucify him afresh, but I want him to be pleased. I want when he looks down, much like Sodom and Gomorrah, when he looks down, he can find one. Hallelujah. That's standing on the word because he knows knows that he's you've hidden the word in your heart Psalms 1 says blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sit in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of the Lord we have to align ourselves so to where our delight is back in the law of the Lord and then he goes on to say in that law doth he meditate day and night he says God says he will hear from heaven He'll forgive our sin. He'll heal our land. We want God to heal our land. My dear sisters and my brothers, uh, my prayer has been that God will heal our land, that he would rid our land from the hatred, that he would heal our land from the years of oppression and the wrongdoings that have been done in this land, that he would heal our land from sickness and disease. But my dear sisters and my brothers, there are steps that we must take, that we must get God's attention. And it's not me pointing the finger saying, it's my sister, it's my brother, it's my mother and my father. I'm saying it's me, oh Lord.
And if we can all get together together and not point the finger at everybody else, but begin to point the finger back at ourselves and say, God, there are some things that I've said and done. There are some even some thoughts that I thought that were not of you because the Bible declares that the very thought of foolishness is sin. And I'm not saying that we all have crazy thoughts, but there are times where we have to realign ourselves. We have to check ourselves. The Bible says in Romans 12, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. These things are reasonable. It is time now that we realign ourselves and we recommit to Christ and say, this is a reasonable service because the good news is, is that when we do all those things, he will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sin and he will heal our land. So I pray on tonight that you were blessed by the word of God. I know that God spoke to me first and I'm telling you there's some things that I'm going to do to realign myself to make sure that my life is pleasing in every aspect because it doesn't matter the title it doesn't matter the position it doesn't matter if you're in the spotlight or if you're not in the spotlight God calls for all of us to be holy he said be ye holy for I am holy so now is the time where we realign ourselves with God and say God we want you we desire you to hear from heaven forgive our sin and heal our land my dear sisters and my brothers I pray that the word of God bless you on tonight. God, I pray that you have a blessed and glorious Wednesday night and I pray that the rest of your week is magnificent and it's wonderful because God is going with you. You're not alone. So this concludes our service. I hope to see you again real soon. Heart share. Invite somebody to be a part of what God is doing because I know in a time like this we need a word from God. God bless you all and I will see you again next week. Same place, same time in Jesus name. Well